without disabilities and people without experience with people with disabilities just do not think about the sexuality of people with disabilities because they don't see people with disabilities as sexual. People without disabilities and people without experience with people with disabilities just do not think about the sexuality of people with disabilities because they don't see people with disabilities as sexual around them. I acquired a spinal cord injury when I was 20 years old in a diving accident while working as a lifeguard. From the time I woke up uh, in the intensive care unit, I was pretty much left on my own to figure out what was going to be going on with my sexuality. I still felt sexual. So my exploration started there. I chose the name the Sexual Health Network because I wanted to focus on sexual health and not sexual inadequacy. Most of the research uh, in the 70s and in the 80s were done by health professionals without disabilities and uh, much of it, while important, missed some of the most important issues to people with disabilities. They don't have an image of how people with disabilities can have a healthy and happy sex life and have pleasure. Well, I think in the spectrum of of disability, uh, meeting somebody is the biggest challenge. When I met Cheryl, I just felt totally accepted by her. I didn't feel like my disability was an issue at all. You know, I didn't really feel it, feel its presence there in that relationship. From the beginning, I never, I tried to relate to him as a person. I never really even saw the chair. You know, we just kind of connected and that was it. I think it's forced us to uh, to be open to different things and try different things depending and, and, and how we're feeling and and you just be willing to, to try different things. Yeah. And we were sexual without intercourse for a while too, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there was a lot of oral sex, right, back and forth. I have what I think is full sensation, but yet the arousal pattern doesn't work the same as before injury. So although I have the sensation, it doesn't create all the time just from stimulation um, the same arousal pattern. Uh, there needs to be more kissing. We both are very big kissers and, and there needs to be other excitement going on too. It really depends on you know how we're feeling that day or you know if he's tired I'll get on top or you know <laughs> it's just, we, we always we're fight. Old. <laughs> You're going to say that? We always fight for who gets on bottom. <laughs> it's really only been uh, in the last five years where research in the area of sex and disability has really started to advance, where people with disabilities began taking the research into our own hands. Well, the focus of my research was on, on pleasure, and, but with pleasure I also looked at two groups of people with spinal cord injuries, those who had orgasm and those who didn't. Traditional definitions of an orgasm focus on genital contractions, um, and in the definitions they're dependent on spinal cord connections between the brain and the genitals, and that's why this big um, myth exists that people with spinal cord injuries can't have orgasms uh, because based on the medical definitions it's not possible. We can't have real or true orgasms. I have good sensations in my penis but I'd say when I'm excited or 
or beforehand will also feel a lot in my chest. You know, we want to call it a heart center, but I've really become focused or kind of moved stuff to where I could feel things warmth in my chest and also my face and ears. So, you know, we'll be lying together and, you know, I'll be stroking her and she'll be stroking my ear and that to me will be extremely arousing too. Medical science cannot explain why when people with a spinal cord injury say where they have no feeling below their chest and no movement, when they have their orgasm, they feel it all over. So when we get to a, an area, um, when we're not looking at orgasm as just genital contractions, but we're looking at it as part of a life process and a sexual self-discovery process. We get to move away from what's happening here and we get to look at all those things that lead up to the ability to have pleasure in orgasm. We just kind of accepted that and said if we can't we'll have, we'll adopt. We used a vibrator and we used fiber stimulation to you know, elicit an ejaculation and we collected it in a cup and did an at-home insemination. It's a challenge, not as in physically challenged, but a I think something like this is kind of a developmental challenge and when you're faced with that, you know, it's an opportunity for growth. And so I think we've both grown I think that I wouldn't have grown in the same way sexually without the disability. If we could really push, and, and, and many of us have been trying to get this on the forefront of the disability agenda, advocates and begin to really fight for our rights to be sexual people. Anybody could end up sitting in my chair. Um, when did we choose your name? And everybody needs someone to love and be loved. I don't think... Uh, we should be discriminated against because you know, we have a particular disability. It's a blessing. Savers. <laughs>